how effective can you be for your patient in removing the deposit? If you can confidently go in there and remove the deposit, if your patient isn't 100% numb, all power to you. But if you are holding back what you have to do for your patient because they are feel, like still feeling something or they're not 100%, then, then now we are not providing the standard of quality care that we need to give them. Sometimes it feels good to stand too while you're administering. So really just fill your body out, check in with the patient, see how they're doing. And if you can kind of mix it up, I think that's best for you for, and your body for long term. And we can't forget to document our topical. I think oftentimes we forget to document that we place topical anesthetic. And that's a drug and we have to we have to mark that down. Get ready for your unofficial dental hygiene podcast. These are the tales of two hygienists, one East Coast RDH and one West Coast guy genist. Listen as they tackle the profession of dental hygiene with humor and enthusiasm. Now, please join Michelle Strange and Andrew Johnston as they tell you a tale of two hygienists. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of A Tale of Two Hygienists, episode number 321. I am your host, Andrew Johnston, and thank you so much for being with us. So several things happening. Right now we are at Chicago Midwinter. It's been fun. We're, we're kind of wrapping up right now as we do this intro it's on, on the weekend. I want to say thank you to everyone who made time for us, whether it was you know a quick passing, a quick hug, a hello, um, or just sitting down talking with us. I mean, it was really fun. It was, it's nice to be around people again that have the same passion for dentistry as we do. Also, thank you so much for the event. So Tony Stefanu, as most of you know, through Trivia Dent, had a couple of events and, you know, I'm just very thankful for, you know, the invite to go do that. Trivia Dent was always fun. I, I mentioned this last episode that we have my friend Daniel's in town and he's the non-dental person. And it was really funny because he put a name in the hat and he didn't even know that he was actually volunteering for a drawing to get into dental trivia. And he lost big time. He's sitting over there laughing at me right now, but it, but it was still fun. It was fun to see that he was doing that, and I just appreciate him him being good sport about it. What else? So we have coming up in this episode, uh, you'll hear in just a few minutes, we have part two of the round table when we talk about a little bit of pediatrics, but also local anesthesia, answering questions from Facebook with Kelly and Tina. And so I think that you're really going to enjoy this one. So next week, we have a fun episode. We have a future doctor, Brandon Everett. He is a D4 student right now. He has a podcast. We caught up with him at Voices of Dentistry, and we just talked about him. We talked about, you know, he is going into the military to do some of his, like, once he becomes a dentist. And we talked about what that looks like, and I think it was good. I think that you guys really enjoyed that one, too. It's not going to be a CE heavy, but it was definitely inspiring. And if you are looking at doing a pathway from hygiene into being a dentist, I think that's a, a good episode for you to listen to. So you'll enjoy that one. This week in social media, I you know what? There are several posts like this. This is one that came up. Matt Saracola, he was on the podcast a really, really long time ago. I think like the first year that we were doing it. He and I are still Facebook friends, and he just got laser certified. And I just, it was brought to my attention. My boss, Raphael, and I, we just did a laser course at the Brown Girl RDH event in, I think it was October of last year. And I'm, I've been seeing this as a, a new thing. Like everyone seems to be getting laser certified. Everyone is learning about like LBR. Everyone's learning about new coding. And so I want to throw it out there. And you guys can email me, Andrew at atelatuhygienist.com. Is laser something that you're interested in? Is laser, and we're going to put a poll on social media as well so you guys can reply to that. But I, I'm just trying to figure out when I was doing restorative hygiene, it seemed like there was a group of us that just loved, loved, loved restorative. But by and large, I would say most hygienists in the state of Washington did not love, love, love restorative. And I'm wondering if laser is going to be the same trend. Um, you know, corporate dentistry is going to end up doing a lot of it. People who are really into perio are probably going to do a lot of it. But the everyday hygienist, is this something that you want to do? Or is this something that you feel like is maybe not something that you want to put into your hands? So let us know on that one. So don't forget, everyone, later this month, we're going to be at the Hinman Show. We're really excited. They have the podcast lounge. Our day is going to be on Thursday, March 17th from 9.30 a.m. until 1 o'clock p.m. So you guys can stop by booth number uh, 757. 
And don't forget, we have other friends that are going to also be at the booth throughout that whole week. So if you're going to the Hinman, the, the dates are March 17th to the 19th. You can go to their website, www.hinman.org, and you can look and see what the lineup is going to be. Because I think there's going to be some really, really good uh, podcasters there. And if you want to be on either my podcast or someone else, make sure you just reach out to us ahead of time so we can get that scheduled. Okay, so we are going to do a thing. Before we, we jump to this episode, we're going to do a thing. So we have a Brittany on. You guys remember Brittany, who used to be, I can't remember what her title used to be, but now she's <laughs> you know director of sales and marketing and master of the universe, basically. She, she runs the podcast, basically. So we thought it would be nice to give you guys an update and also play a little bit of a game because I stopped looking at, at some of these stats like long ago. I still look at download numbers, but kind of regional differences and regional variances, I, I stopped looking. But Michelle and I used to play this a lot where we would kind of guess the top few states, the top few cities. And so before we get into all that, I want to give a, a big shout out to these states and the cities that we're going to talk about because you guys have been supporting the podcast for a really long time. But my guess is that there might be some changes in some of these states and cities. And so if you are a state that is, or a city that has really come on strong in this last like year and a half or two years, uh, we really appreciate that. And if you drop down, we're going to be in touch. And yes, we will be coming after you if you if you drop down. But here's the thing. I want to, no, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to go into the like, statistics of, well, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're worse. Maybe it's just everyone's, everyone got better above you, but whatever. Anyways, okay. <laughs> so what are we going to start with first, Brittany? And what's the time period that we're looking at? So we are going to look at the first part of 2022 versus the beginning months of 2021 last year. Okay. Um, so are states or cities first? Let's go states first because that'll okay. probably help. So my thought is it's probably going to be the same states that we've always been really strong in. I guess I'll, I'll guess what top three and then you can just read the top ten. That way we're not taking too much of people's time. Sure. Mm-hmm. Okay. So California is number one. Ding, ding, ding. Okay. Um, Texas is number two. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah. And then Illinois is number three. Right. <laughs> Really? Really. Um, New York? <laughs> Florida. Andrew, your people are going to be very upset with you. Is it Florida? Is it Washington State? Mm-hmm. Oh, Washington State. <laughs> I thought that once I moved away, they didn't really care about me. Well, they didn't care about me when I lived there, so whatever. Boom, <laughs> take that, Washington State. Yes, and uh, this year, they have made it to the top three. Wow. Well, that tells me, thank you for a little foreshadowing that they weren't there last year, so I won't guess oh, them. Uh, no, it's okay. <laughs> so um, can you run through the top 10 for 2022 states? Yes, absolutely. So we've got California, Texas, and Washington, which we mentioned. Wow. So n- number four, Illinois. They yeah. Drop down a, a, a mark. Uh, Massachusetts, Wisconsin, mm. Pennsylvania, Utah, Florida, and Kansas. Nice. Florida, I feel like, used to be really, really high. Um, and Utah was really, really high. And they dropped off. But I'm, not, I'm glad to see them, that they're kind of back. So um, interesting. Okay. So let's do states from 2020. One, 2021, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, California is number one. And Texas is number two. Correct. Okay. Those are the constants. Thank California you. and Texas, I mean, you're rocking they're so, in. I mean, l- they love CE. Very popular states also, right? Um, and I would, gosh, I'm sorry to do this. Illinois is going to be number three. They got to be. Incorrect. Really? Mm-hmm. Is it the same? It's not Washington. Nope. Um... Florida? No. New York? Yes. Good job, New York. I knew you were there. Okay, go ahead and run through the, the rest. But what is interesting, so if you look at 2021, you know, New York is top three, but 2022, where did you go, New York? You didn't, what you're not happened? in the top 10. That is interesting. I don't know if it's the pandemic and everyone moved out of New York or what. That's a really great you point, know? though. I think, and then is Florida on this list too? Yes. You guys, like, everyone moved to Florida, it felt like. So I just wonder <laughs> if, like, all the New Yorkers left and moved to Florida. But, okay, go ahead and run through the list. Sure. So in uh, the beginning of 2021, we had California, Texas, and New York, Washington. Nice. Illinois, Florida, mm-hmm. North Carolina, Ooh. Georgia, Maryland, and Georgia. Arizona. Good job. And so, Maryland. you know, we had five of our states that were on our top for 2021 
um, were not on our top for 2022 and some new players in 2022. Now, the sample size is a little bit smaller because we only did a couple months, right? Didn't we just do the first couple months of... Right. So we're really looking so primarily at Kelly Qualis, who is on this episode today, like was pushing out all of her stuff. She's from Arizona. So it's like, well, that may be why... Exactly. You know. Depending so, on our guests, okay. it would be interesting to see what episodes we aired yeah. the first two months of the year. And yeah. Okay. Let's do some cities. Let's start with 2021, and then we'll see how we've grown. So the top three cities, um, historically, I think, have been New York City. Correct. Is that number one? It is. Okay. Um, Chicago. You want me to tell you if that's number two or? Is it number two or number three? It is number three. Okay. Um, And then I would say, um, I can't remember what the states were. I would say, like, uh, maybe, like, San Francisco, San Jose, something in California. Uh, it is in California, LA. but it is uh, Los Angeles. Yeah, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. That's, that's a lot. Okay, what's the rest of the top 10? For 2021, so New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, San Francisco, Seattle. Nice. Washington, D.C., Boston, Charlotte, Dallas, and Minneapolis. Nice. I'm, I'm happy to hear Minneapolis is up there. Mm-hmm. Okay. So for 2022, we have... Um, <laughs> the same three isn't it it's gotta it be the same three not what Mm-mm. okay uh it's new york is still number one nope chicago oh yeah are they in the top three new york no oh I mean, my gosh we'll chat about that but <laughs> okay uh chicago nope what the crap <laughs> um Boise, Idaho. I don't know. Like, <laughs> let's just start picking some obscure ones. I know. I was kind of hoping. I was like, wait a minute. I'm surprised Idaho isn't on there now that I've relocated. Yeah. Uh, Dallas. <laughs> is Dallas up there? Phoenix? It is not. No. Okay. I think I'm going to have to give up and just have you read them all. Yeah. I'm so. really <laughs> sub- Seattle. Yes. It's number two. Okay. Uh, read, go ahead and read all. Sure. Topics. So San Francisco is our no- new number one. Nice. And then Seattle and Los Angeles. And then we have Chicago, Boston, Salt Lake City, Dallas, Wichita, um, Philadelphia, and New York. So New York moved wow. from number one in 2021 to number 10 in 2022. And then they fell off the too, And right? they fell off the state. So I'm, I'm pretty sure just everyone moved out of New York. That's my, I'm not going to give too much shade to New York. You yeah. Know, y'all, y'all will come back. Well, I will say welcome back to Salt Lake City. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm sorry that I pushed you guys away for so long. I, my guess, though, is we've had Hygiene Edge on a lot in 2021. And so that's probably why like, as we're starting to see you know, regionally uh, maybe a little bit of a push there. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, so thank you so much for everyone that's, that are in those cities in the States. Please make sure that you guys share that with your friends. Uh, celebrate your guys' win. And if you are maybe not winning, then maybe tell your friends so you guys can be in the top three uh, next time. Um, okay, I think that's, that's it for this intro. Thank you so much for being with us. Enjoy this episode with Kelly and Tina. Okay, so here's a question. This is, I think, from this is from a hygienist this time. So there's a hygienist I know of that always uses Aura Kicks for SRP. I mean, every single time, no matter the depth of the pocket, severity of bone loss, or radiographic calculus. She says that that has always been enough. Never have they needed local anesthesia. I find this hard to believe. I use Aura Kicks as well when I'm able, but I would say 90% of the time, local anesthesia. How about you guys slash girls? And then there's an edit on this one because it was an anonymous post in one of the groups that said that they were not being critical, more so curious if there are uh, many other hygienists that don't use local anesthesia much slash they just feel that six to seven millimeter pockets, most patients would need it. So I, I, before we answer this question, I want to say that there are very, very much regional differences here. And this is something that in Washington and Oregon, when I was practicing is way different than Florida out of necessity. So because down here, I think local anesthesia passed in 2011, something like that, maybe 2013. I'm not actually sure of the date, but it's, it's relatively, I think within the last decade or so, local anesthesia probably passed in the Florida area. And Most, I would say most of our hygienists are not certified for local anesthesia. So even though it's available, they never went back and got it. And so Aura Kicks has been the only thing. And then the doctors are very, very busy. And so they make it work. So 
I want to throw out that caveat out there before we start talking about it too much, because I think that that is very, very important to know, like regionally, where are you at and what is kind of like the standard for your area, but thoughts on these things. Well, my question would be, I'd want to see, you know, how effective is that hygienist being? Because again, it comes down to how effective can you be for your patient in removing the deposit? If you can confidently go in there and uh, remove the deposit, if your patient isn't 100% numb, all power to you. But if if you are holding back what you have to do for your patient because they are feel, like still feeling something or they're not 100%, then, then now we are not providing the standard of quality care that we need to give them. So that's, that's, that's the caveat, I think, to the whole thing. So, you know, can that hygienist do an amazing job at that non-surgical periotherapy, clearing out all the debris and, and making sure that there isn't any more calculus anywhere to be found? Yeah, she probably can, or he probably can if, you know, but again, how is the patient reacting to that? And can, is that on a consistent basis for every single patient? hundred percent agree. So if, if you're able to be effective and the patient's comfortable and you're looking at behaviors and signs that they're comfortable and making sure you're also checking in with them, um, then yeah, for sure. But you have to make sure you're efficient as well. I have lots of thoughts on this and I'm going to try and keep them all to myself. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think the biggest thing that we as hygienists need to focus on is in our office, when do we refer? And I don't think that we talk about that ever, ever, right. ever, 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 ever. And it's a conversation that you need to be had with the doctor. It needs to be had with the whole team. Our assistants that are helping us out should know even like just based on a period chart, they should know, okay. Andrew's going to want to refer or Andrew's going to want to start initial therapy, have them back for a reval to isolate which teeth need a real referral and which ones have responded positively. And I think that, yeah, revals aren't happening the way they should be. I think referrals aren't happening the way they should be. And I couldn't agree more about, you know, it's the, it's the clinical effectiveness. Are you able to do the things? And if you're not able to do the things, is it a you thing or is it a patient thing? And, you right. know, I've had lots of hygienists that are aggressive, <laughs> very <laughs> aggressive individuals when they, when they're working on their patients and they, you know, or kicks the heck out of them and it's fine. It works for them in their hands. They've learned a technique. I think that maybe the rest of us maybe don't know. Um, but because they're so aggressive, maybe they're putting the tip in differently than the rest of us. Like, there's so many things that we need to think about. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to answer this, this one question, but mm -hmm. anyway, sorry. I know I talked a lot on that question. No, that was my bad. Well, and I want to say, we have to remember that when we're doing periotherapy, it is a medical procedure Yes, and that, you know, how many times do we go to our other healthcare providers that they are debriding a wound like, and would say, well, we're just, we're not going to get you numb. <laughs> I don't know. I just, I think that that's what we have to remember is that we are debriding wounds and that can be painful. And I wouldn't want to have a wound debrided or an ingrown toenail removed or anything else like that. You know, a, a mole removed for cancer, you know, screenings, like numb me up, please, <laughs> because I want to be able to make sure I come back and get the follow-up done too. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. no, that's a good point too, because they're, you know, patients are going to come back if they're not comfortable, <laughs> you know, right. like the, yeah. it's a practice builder right there or practice, <laughs> practice destroyer, I guess. Well, we hear yeah. too. That's, I think that's a common complaint we hear is, oh, the other, the other person really hurt me or they were super heavy handed. So they're all already imprinting their experience onto us of how, so we want to deliver, you know, quality care and be efficient. And so that's also a huge consideration is, you know, changing, changing the story about dentistry as well. That's a great point. Great point. All right. Number eight. Okay. So there was a question about someone using local anesthesia during a prophy. And then they asked a question about clinical notes. Oh, oh I see where I was going with this one, but, but I don't want to talk about the whole clinical notes part of it. I want to talk about doing local anesthesia for prophies. Is that something that you've heard of being done regularly? I've heard that happening with for people who are 
generally have some dental sensitivity that they'll do that. Now, that's where I think something like Oricix comes into great play for for that type of uh, procedure. Or, you know, there is the, um, oh, is I can't remember. I think is it still on the market? There's the, the polishing paste Novamin or Novamin, something like that. Yeah. yeah, to help with that. Um, but I would say for a, a general profi, you know, I, w- I, I would use more of the topical approach. Yeah, I, I agree. I have had to numb for a profi before, but, you know, infiltrating and isolated just to make sure they're comfortable. But it, once again, it's a tool that's dependent on who you have in the chair and it's situational. So, you know, not throwing that totally off the table, but does it happen often? No. I, I would question the diagnosis. If I'm being right. truthful on that one. Like it's, I'm sure there are people that have just like no bone loss, you know, no loss of attachment whatsoever and are just super, super sensitive or yeah, like maybe mm-hmm. it's, it's like it's in their head and they need yeah. to like, they need that assurance. Right. Sure. I'm sure that happens. But my guess is it's probably like healthy on reduced periodontia. Maybe it's supposed to be a period maintenance patient that's been stabilized for a long time. Something like that. Um, follow up question to this, this though, they, they said, um, in this scenario, they also build out for local anesthesia. Did you know that that was not, did you know that there's a code for this? Yes, but who, I mean, who uses it? Who uses right, it? I was exactly. going to say that. <laughs> so the code is D9215. Yeah. And it's, it's supposed to be, if I remember right, in conjunction with restorative and surgical procedures, maybe. Um, so I think it's mostly for, supposed to be for like doctor side, but this is for a profi. So one, I don't know if, th- if that's accurate still, that nomenclature of that code, but is that something that you have ever done? No, <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> okay. No. Um, is it something that they could do? <laughs> uh, they, well, they charge $15 for this thing is what they said. So. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen it on a treatment plan before. So that's why I'm familiar. And I kind of went like, scratch my head like what the heck is going on over there (laughs) i mean yeah so interesting it is it's very curious though now i think about it's like why don't we bill out for that i mean it's it's sure there's product there but it's also expertise it's like everything else that we do is based on our ability to deliver this thing why don't we bill out for that no good point it is good point Mm -hmm. especially as i we just said earlier right it's we're it's a medical procedure yeah Mm -hmm. you know I guarantee you, you're getting charged for that if you go to a, you know, an MD. Yeah, yep, yeah. for sure. Hmm. All right, Dennis, let's get on top of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> Number nine. Well, we heard from this one post about well, that's anesthetizing for go. a profi first. <laughs> Not a credible source, I don't think, though. <laughs> okay. Uh, Number nine. Okay. This is, I'm just going to read it the way it is was written. Anyone here gone a while without doing local anesthesia? I haven't done local in almost a year, and I'm terrified of giving an IA. Any personal tips? There's four S's. Um, I'm already going to view videos, but would love some insight. So what can they do if it's been a bit since they've done? Well, you were just mentioning, Andrew, how you haven't been that bit of a frequent flyer with local. And I think all of us, you know, dependent on our situation um, where I've kind of stepped out of clinical, but if I have to come back in and help or temp, um, it's kind of just putting mindset, like we discussed before, putting yourself in that mindset, like, you know, I'm going to do my job 100%, make sure this patient's comfortable, make sure I pull all of my skills and my techniques and my tools and Make sure mm-hmm. I'm stable. I'm breathing. So that's really is just get yourself in check. You know what you're doing. You've done it before. So go in there with confidence. Yeah, and you know I agree. The um, individual even said they're going to watch videos. I would say watch videos, review some um, information, take a continuing education course, grab one of your coworkers and say, hey. Um, can we, I want to calibrate or I want to refresh some stuff and you may not even have to completely inject them, but just tilt them back, take a look in their mouth and, you know, feel for the anatomy and, you know, just re reorient yourself with the entire process. Find that person in the clinic that's been really mean to you lately and just <laughs> go to town on practicing. <laughs> and, and, I, and I need love, help with this. Love the syringe with bupivacaine. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> like, oh, whoops, wrong color. Oh, I'm so sorry. This is going to be hours long. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
um, so going back to what we talked about before, Tina, you did the the uh, the episode with the Hygiene Edge ladies. Mm-hmm. They are they have some great videos. I don't know if you guys have had a chance to watch their videos, but it's something that when we have um, we have a thing in Florida where we have foreign trained doctors that are given a hygiene license. And so it's something that I want them to re- refresh and review. And Hygiene Edge has all of the videos that I want them to be looking at because like the technique is there, the angulation is there. Um, so I really like that they said that they're going to go back and watch some videos. I would also say um, a hands-on course. There's not very many hands-on courses, but I I don't love the, and unfortunately I've done it, but like the the didactic courses, I don't feel are as beneficial in this particular situation than other ones. Now, if you don't remember why you're giving what you're giving, then to go take a clinical or a didactic <laughs> one. But if you need, there's, there are plenty of hands-on courses though, too, outside of the United States, which we can't really travel to a lot right now. I'm trying to think if there's something else for them. There's gotta be something, but yeah, I think, I think the hands-on is where I would send them. Okay. Question number 10, sitting or standing, which is best? What makes you feel better? Yeah. Yeah. I, I have done both and it's usually like after a a long day and my back is cricking and cracking. So I'll, I'll move the chair up and, and just make sure, especially like, you know, with my pediatric experience, you're having to like, your ergonomics are out the window. So Mm -hmm. if I feel for myself, it's more beneficial to stand then that's when I pull that in there. Sometimes it feels good to stand too while, mm-hmm. while you're yeah. administering. So really just fill your body out, check in with the patient, see how they're doing. And if you can kind of mix it up, I think that's best for you for and your body yeah. for long-term. Yeah, and I would say it really depends upon your body style and type. Yeah. But I will say when you stand, you can get closer to the patient, That which means you're arm is closer to your body and you can have that stability there. Yes. But yes. you know, you can you can do it sitting too. I know there's a lot of people who just hate standing all the time. So, mm. um but yeah. There's a lot of hygienists out there that stand. Yeah, I think great answers. I, I 100% agree with them both and I think the the caution is just making sure that you're adjusting your angulations when you're like, so say that you're doing like an IA or whatever. Yeah. Um, I think when I'm sitting, I do it differently than when I'm standing. And I notice that when I'm standing, I'm a lot more effective because my angulation is, must be just a little bit different. It's a little bit higher, a little bit deeper. Um, and so, yeah. So watch that. Have you noticed that doctors sometimes will sit for certain procedures and then stand for like extractions? So I'll stand for extractions. Yes. Yes. So it's interesting. I think there, I think there is like a lot to be said about body positioning and, and the sort. Okay. So going back to pediatrics, this next question, it's for the doctors, but we'll pretend you guys are both doctors today. Doctors help exclamation point. I love reading these. What? I wish this is my job is just to read online stuff. This is And so you should great. see Andrew's facial expressions right now. It's hilarious. <laughs> I have reread some of the materials from school for pediatric patients, but can't seem to keep it in my head, right? That happens. Uh, What is your preoperative pediatric evaluation? So I think what they're going for is like your, how do you intake uh, children into your practice differently than adults, probably in relation to knowing that you're going to be doing some sort of local anesthesia or extractions or surgery or something, nitrous even, um, so like, what do you, what do you collect that's differently or what I would assume is like, what should you actually probably be also collecting on adults that you don't? <laughs> so I'm assuming maybe just kind of where my mind goes with this question, cause it's very broad, but we look at behavior notes from each recall appointment. So we use like the Frankel scale. If you're not familiar, it's just, it depends on what was their behavior like for a cleaning and, you know, were they really good would be a Frankel one or was it a Frankel zero where they were like hunched in the corner, fingernails latched into the wall. So that's part of the intake process. So if you know upon examination, if you're able to get in there, that they're going to need treatment in the future, how you address that is going to be a little different than, you know, a 12 year old that has been going to the dentist since they were one and they're completely comfortable at the dentist. So that's part of our intake. Then also working with 
oral conscious sedation patients, you know, we're looking at vital signs. We're looking at, you know, oxygen saturation, pulse rate. You're reviewing medical history. You're making sure their ASA classification is conducive to what you're doing and the local anesthetic. So that's where my mind goes with this question. Tina, do you... Well, I would say along all of those things, but one of the things that we probably do for our kids that we don't do for our adults is get their height and weight mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because because our anesthetic dosaging for our kiddos, you know, it, we can overdose them so easily if we think about, uh, oh, well, I'm going to give them, you know, five carps of this anesthetic, which may not do well for them with their weight that they're at. So for our kids, we really do need to pay attention to that. So, you know, have them when they walk in, they have a scale, maybe a little height checker and include that into the vitals. Yeah. And that's usually done in pediatric practices where every recall or treatment procedure, they're weighed beforehand. So just like that scenario, we know how much we can give them. I can tell you, I never really gave more than a a carp and a half, two carps and dependent on the person, but really that's not necessary. So that's a huge consideration. Yeah. Can you imagine weighing our adult patients, how much like kickback we get? Like we can't even take their blood pressure for crying out loud yeah. right now. I know. They'd like, have hey, the please card. get on this scale and we're going to track it for you. <laughs> oh my gosh. I can just yeah. imagine. Yeah. It. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That uh, would not go well. No. <laughs> Um, They're like, but I just, I just stopped at the donut shop first. Well, that's not helping you at all. <laughs> it's like, why does everyone always have an excuse too? It's like your blood pressure is high. It's like, well, I just had a cup of coffee, or yeah. like, yeah. I, or if I take my meds this morning. I'm like, well, yeah. How many days in a row have you not, not taken your meds? Like, this is not going to be. Oh my gosh. So. Okay, so as we're winding down, you know, the, the students have stuck with us for you know, this long, congratulations students for mm-hmm. listening to two episodes of this. So is there any question that we should be asking ourselves or that we should, that we need our students to be paying attention when it comes to local anesthesia and or pediatrics and local anesthesia that we haven't covered yet? Well, I would say that you definitely want to make sure that you check in with, so if you're usually you're administering local anesthetic for the dentist, that's going to perform a procedure you want to have a good working relationship and know what's expected and really know what what is the goal of the treatment procedure? How long is it going to be? You know, like I mentioned before, how long is it before they're in that room, you know, sitting down and prepping? I think that's super important to kind of get the like the lay of the land, if you will, in that practice that you're in. And then everything else we discussed today, but you definitely want to know the mechanics of the practice. And so so you're just timing everything right too. Is there anything that needs to be in the charts specific to local anesthesia that maybe our audience needs a refresher on? Well, for sure, the type of injection that was done, whether it was an IA or, you know, an ASA infiltration, and we'll use infiltration like we normally use it. (laughs) Um, like the type of injection, if there was a positive aspiration or not, you know, positive aspiration no, or there was a negative aspiration, the, of course, the anesthetic type and how much you gave. And I know there's some people that will argue if it's a number of cartridges or a number of milligrams of drug, but I, I would just say, put the number of cartridges that you used with the name of the anesthetic, including if it had vasoconstrictor or not, and how much vasoconstrictor it had in that. And how did the patient react in general? Like, did they handle it okay? Or did they start feeling funny or faint? Did they feel a zip in their lip, you know, when they were got their IA kind of a thing? So just a little bit of the experience. Also time dispense too. That way, if, you know, doctors checking in on, you know, how much longer do I have? Can I do a couple more exams? You know, when that was given and you're checking in with the patient, you know, how are you feeling? Does it feel numb? So having that conversation too is helpful. And we can't forget to document our topical. I think oftentimes we forget to document that we place topical anesthetic and that's a drug and we have to, we have to mark that down. Yeah. Good point. All right. So, um, outside of the topics that we're talking about, any advice for our students, anything that you think that they need to know? 
Well, on the topic of anesthesia, you know, Andrew, earlier you asked me about, you know, the clinical board and, and anesthesia, but I want to say my anesthesia board experience is, you know, when you do your anesthesia board, you have to do two injections, an IA and a PSA. And for me, when I did this, I did my IA and you have to say when you're at your point of insertion, when you're at your point of deposition and your aspiration. So I got all the way through when I got to doing my aspiration and I pulled back on the thumb ring and I looked and I'm like, oh, it's all clear. I go, I've got a negative aspiration. And there was like a pause and one person said, okay. And then I looked again and I saw this wisp of red coming through and I like panicked. And I was like, uh, actually, wait, I want to change that to a positive aspiration. And, you know, I, they allowed me to withdraw and change out every, my needle, my cartridge and everything like that. And I, I share that with you guys with the students and everybody to say that it's okay if you're doing your board exam and you say you have a negative aspiration and then you look again and you see that it's positive to say, actually, I need to change that to a positive aspiration, change things out and do it again. It doesn't mean you fail. It just means that you recognize something different and that it's okay. It really will be okay. So Getting a positive aspiration isn't the worst thing that can happen on your board exams. Recognize if you fail to recognize that you had a positive aspiration, that's what's going to get you. Yeah, I I hit bone on my IA, um, and of course it sends you into flustered fight or flight. And just stay calm, stay calm, and just think of the next step. How you learned how to get yourself out of this, um, and so you know it's just we're we've all been through it. We've all been through it. And you know, you got it up there. So just pull it out and stay calm. Yep. You both are so amazing. Uh, I'm sure our audience is going to have some questions for you. They're going to want to reach out. Uh, what is the best way for them to contact you? Well, you can always uh, connect up with me at Teacher Tina RDH. Uh, the website's teachertinardh.com or Instagram or Facebook at Teacher Tina RDH. And I do have a cool little free anesthesia guide available. So if you just go to the website, you can get that free anesthesia guide as well. You can find me at Kelly, K E L L E Y, at mymyomyhealth.com. My Instagram handle is mymyomyhealth. Awesome. Thank you both so much for making the time. Uh, this was, this has been so much fun for me. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks, you, Andrew. Andrew.